Hello and welcome to today's interview on Brookline Interactive Group. We've got Ken List, the president of the Brookline Historical Society. We're not just going to yammer on about Brookline's history. We're going to focus on Florida Ruffin Ridley, who uh, is a really important and somewhat hidden figure in Brookline, but who's very topical because, in fact, tomorrow at 3.30 right here on Brookline Interactive Group, you can watch the renaming ceremony where the school formerly known as Coolidge Scorner School, before that known as Edward Devotion School, uh, will ceremoniously be renamed the Florida Ruffin Ridley School. So without further ado, Ken, uh, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks, Tommy. Glad to be here. Let's start by telling folks, uh, sharing with folks a little bit about the Brookline Historical Society. Some viewers are familiar with, but others may not be. Uh, what's what's the deal? What's the Brookline S Historical Society all about? Well, it's a it's an old organization that's uh, that's been around for uh, 120 years. Uh, we are dedicated to uh, telling stories about Brookline, uh, encouraging people to be interested in. Uh, Brookline's past and and uh, and what we can learn uh, from the past uh, about the town that uh, that we all live, work, uh, play, and etc. And I imagine you've been involved in the Brookline Historical Society for some time. Some say you and the society have history. Uh, tell us a little bit about about your involvements in the Brookline Historical Society and and you know how it is you came to be uh, involved in this topic in the first place. Yeah, uh, I, I moved to Brookline with my family in 1996. I became interested in an old house around the corner for me and started doing some uh, research uh, around it and uh, did a presentation for the Historical Society and was invited to join the board and then took over as president in, uh, in 2009. So I've got a, I've got a long term uh, <laughs> uh, presidency. Uh, and I'm always interested uh, in finding stories, often stories that, uh, that haven't been told. And uh, the story of Florida Ruffin Ridley is, is one of those stories. It came about when uh, I heard somebody say that Roland Hayes, the African-American singer who lived in Brookline for many years was the, the first African-American to own property in, uh, in Brookline. And I know that uh, when people say something is the first or the oldest, uh, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And I thought I'd try and find out. And as I did some research, I came upon this woman who I'd never heard of called Florida Ruffin Ridley, who with her husband, Ulysses, uh, may have been the first to uh, African-American to own property in Brookline. It's uh, impossible to say for sure, but certainly it was uh, 30 years before Roland Hayes. And so for her, uh, and her husband to own property. Uh, this is when the nineteen, the eighteen, eighteen ninety four. They yeah, bought their so, they bought their house, which still stands on uh, Kent Street, uh, on the east side of Kent Street, uh, next to what were then the railroad tracks, and now the uh, the D line. And so, uh, to be able to purchase a house in eighteen ninety four, it didn't take the kind of money it takes today. But uh, not everybody was a homeowner. And so that suggests that she um, has, uh, was already relatively established somehow. Tell us about maybe how she got to that point. What was she doing before 1894? Well, she, she, she grew up in, in Boston. Uh, her, her parents were both uh, very uh, prominent and active people. Her father, George Ruffin, was the first black graduate of Harvard Law School, uh, the first black judge in uh, Massachusetts and a member of the uh, Boston Common Council, which was a, a kind of a, a, a legislative body for the city of Boston before 1910. And her mother, uh, uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin was a, an activist who uh, founded uh, women's organizations and African-American civil rights organizations that her daughter became involved in. Uh, Florida married a man named uh, Ulysses Ridley, who was a prominent tailor in Boston. And uh, they, they were among the, the fairly well-to-do among Boston's African-American population. And now uh, Florida was a teacher. And um, I know that she uh, was a teacher before she had children, and uh, and then she had a bit of a, a wiggle and a waggle. Tell us, tell us what happened at that point in her life. 
Well, she, she attended a school called the Boston Normal School, later became Boston Teachers College, and uh, graduated and became the second uh, black woman uh, to teach in the, in the Boston schools. And she uh, kept that position until she married uh, Ulysses Ridley in 1888. And although uh, married men could still be teachers, married women could not. So she gave up her uh, career at that time. Uh, she and her husband moved to Georgia, where, where he was originally from, uh, for, for a few years, where they worked to develop kindergartens, and then uh, came back to, to Boston. And, uh, and in, in 1894, uh, moved to Brookline. And, and so they got to Brookline and uh, I know Florida was involved in an awful lot of things. Uh, when they got back to Brooklyn, was she, was she again a teacher or was that, um, was she moving on to something else? Yeah, she couldn't teach as a married woman uh, and she became involved with her mother in an organization um, that uh, tried to uh, promote uh, black women. And they started a, a newspaper called uh, the Women's Era. Their, their organization was called the Women's Era Club. Uh, it was the first uh, publication uh, published, owned and managed by black women in the United States. And uh, they, they really took on a lot of issues. And uh, in 1895, a uh, year after she moved to Brookline, they ran a, a national conference uh, here in, in Boston. And I'm just going to read you a, a, a quote uh, from Florida about the Women's Era Club that she and her mother were involved in. She said, we, the women of the Women's Era Club, enter the field to work hand in hand with women, generally for humanity and humanity's interest. Not the Negro alone, but the Chinese, the Hawaiian, the Russian Jew, the oppressed everywhere are subjects for our consideration, not the needs of the colored women, but women everywhere are our interests. So I imagine that, you know, not everyone was thrilled by her efforts. After all, if everyone was thrilled by her efforts, they probably wouldn't have been needed in the first place. Um, do you know of any pushback she received, either um, political, or written, or more, more personal and physical? Uh, do you know of any of those sorts of struggles she may have gone through? Well, you know, I, I think actually she was more the, the, the pusher than the pushy in a lot of ways, and that, that, that she pushed back against others. There was a, 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 an a incident, if, if you will, where a, a British woman who was um, working for uh, women's rights and protecting women from uh, abuse uh, did not want to take on the issue of lynching. There was a sense that um, lynching uh, was uh, taking away from the issue. And she uh, very aggressively uh, wrote uh, a response to this woman, uh, pointing out that uh, a lot of the, the fear of how lynching would take away, uh, opposition to lynching or a focus on lynching would take away from the women's rights movement was based on, on myths about black men. And, uh, and, and that uh, um, almost buying into the idea that uh, the men who were being lynched were, were, were guilty. And she really fought back against that. So, so uh, um, she really did a lot to, 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 to push and, and make sure that uh, um, voices that weren't always heard were heard in, in, in new ways. And it sounds like she's at a, what turns out to be a really interesting intersection. And that is the intersection of um, women's suffrage and um, voting for people of color. And I know there was tremendous tension. Um, there were many suffragettes who uh, were focused on women receiving the right to vote and were afraid if that included black women, it would make it more difficult to make the incremental progress they were going for. Whereas others took the position that right is right and we need to fight for all. And I, I imagine uh, it certainly sounds like she would have taken the latter position um, if it were put to her quite quite that directly. Uh, was she involved, do you know, of with uh, suffrage movements um, directly? And and how did what was her role? How did that play out? Uh, she she was she most definitely was she was a member of a suffrage organization in in Brookline and and suffrage was very controversial in Brookline there were very strong opinions as there always are in Brookline on uh, both sides of the suffrage question um, 
and uh, she advocated for it. She also, uh, women could vote in Brookline uh, before uh, 1920 in school, school board elections. And uh, it's interesting, I'm not sure what the first year was that they could vote, but there's an article uh, in the, I can't remember if it was in the Globe or in the local paper uh, about in 1902 about women uh, lining up to vote for the school board. And the only woman who's mentioned by name is Florida Ruffin Ridley. So she was, she was out there making sure. There's also a, a, another uh, wonderful quote from her in 1897 uh, about suffrage where she said that no group of men should have the power to say who should, or who should not exercise the rights of freedom. The suffrage question is like so many other questions, no question at all if faced in its nakedness. So uh, I, I, I don't know where she came down on uh, whether uh, suffrage should be uh, universal um, and, and uh, uh, in including people of all color, uh, but uh, she, she certainly, everything I know about her, uh, that, that's certainly what, what she would have believed in. So that's remarkable, right? She's, she's involved in quite a few different places where she, she did things herself that were remarkable, but also um, used her time and her effort to uh, push for progress uh, for entire groups of people uh, within Brookline and, and beyond. And so, uh, you know, we talked about suffrage. We certainly talked about her being perhaps the first homeowner, um, her work with, um, with the newspaper. Uh, there's more though, right? Uh, what else is there to know? Well, you know, in, 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 uh, in preparing to talk to you, um, I, 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 research never ends and always finding new things. And I found some new things uh, today. And uh, one of the things that, that, that really uh, impressed me about her is I, I knew how dedicated she was, how uh, fierce an advocate she was for the causes that uh, she fought for. Something that I, I kind of knew, but never really sunk in until I started uh, looking at a lot of things today is how efficient and effective and organized she was is that when, when she took up a cause it wasn't just passion that she brought to it she 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 brought power she brought organization she knew how to uh, to work for change and uh, I've, I've been really uh, impressed by that and uh, and it came up in, in in so many things it came up in her work for suffrage it came up in her work against lynching uh, it came up in uh, the work with her mother to uh, found uh, national black women's organizations um, the, the the organization part of it was a, was an important part to both of them that they they they, they knew that uh, it wasn't just a matter of uh, believing in something and fighting for it, you had to be organized, and uh, and and you had to organize others. And I, I think that's something that has uh, really Im impressed me. And I keep finding new new ways that she did it. Um, after uh, during World War One, uh, she worked to uh, develop um, support for black soldiers um, who were not getting the same kind of support that white soldiers were getting. And again, she just kind of put herself into it and brought people together to to make things happen. Um, uh, while she was doing this, while she was uh, working on all of these things, she, she was also a, a co-founder of the Second Unitarian Church in, in, in Brookline, um, which uh, kind of broke off from uh, the first parish, which was as, as the population grew. But um, she also found time to write. She, she wrote a lot uh, about uh, the causes that she be believed in, but she also wrote uh, short stories. And, um, and in fact, uh, she and Dorothy West, another famous uh, black writer, were members of something called the uh, Saturday Evening Quill Club in Boston uh, in, the in, the, in the 1920s. Uh, they published a journal um, and uh, it was sort of like Boston's own little Harlem Renaissance with a magazine that published uh, stories by, by both of them and others. So she really uh, put so much into uh, pretty much everything that she did. She was also uh, interested in, in history. Um, she uh, helped found an organization called the Society of Descendants of Early American Negroes. Um, she wrote uh, 
something called the other Bostonians about the history of black Bostonians. And I, I, I think about um, Black Lives Matter and uh, we, we think about Black Lives Matter as being uh, focused on, um, uh, on police and, and just the value of black lives. But uh, I, I would say in a sense that I, I, I think that she thought also that black history matters. And that uh, while she was fighting for the future and the present of uh, African-Americans in Boston and in the country, she was also fighting for the importance of their past. And I, and I, I think that's uh, 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 as someone who's uh, uh, a, um, so interested in history, um, that really impressed me too, that, that, that she really saw the whole picture and that how all of these things were tied together, that the, the way we tell the story of the past affects our present and our future. And, and she clearly saw that and, and really uh, worked for it. And, and, and that's, that's really uh, impressive to me. Do you think that the, the greater Brookline community, and by that I mean the white people who lived in Brookline at her time, appreciated her and her efforts, were sort of oblivious to her and her efforts, uh, were frustrated um, by, by her. How do you think that um, the, the community around her uh, felt about what she was up to? Well, it's hard to say. We don't have a lot of the, uh, direct evidence of how she was uh, received, but, but she was... Um, integrated, if you will, in, 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 into society. I think she was, she was uh, in, in a sense, the fact that uh, that 1902 article about women voting for the school committee, she's the only one mentioned. Um, she, she was recognized, people knew who she was. They, um, she, she was involved, uh, when she was involved in the, the suffrage association, that was a mixed race organization. Um, and just, just knowing the, the limited population of African Americans in Brookline at the time, it was mostly a white organization. And uh, so she, she was involved with that. And um, I, I think the fact uh, from that quote earlier that she talked about uh, not only being interested in, in black women, um, but in, in women of all kinds. And she mentions a Russian Jew, she mentions Hawaiians, which is kind of interesting, but this was in, uh, I think that quote was from 1897 and the United States had recently taken, uh, taken over Hawaii, which had been an independent kingdom. Actually, the last queen of Hawaii actually moved to Brookline for a brief, brief time. So, so she was aware of other people um, and, and their causes. And I, I, I can't help but think that uh, um, that, that helped her be uh, accepted and, uh, and recognized as, as someone who uh, just was, was worthy of consideration for what she did um, and, and who she was and, and, uh, um, and, and not, or despite the color of her skin. And so we've just got a few minutes left. I, if it's all right with you, I'd like to circle back to um, the renaming of the Coolidge Corner School, previously named the Edward Devotion School. Uh, you know, before her name was floated as one possibility, uh, I, I had never heard of her. I suspect uh, many people in Brookline had never heard of her. Frankly, I think many people in Brookline still haven't heard of her. Um, and so do you have any um, sense for sort of how her name ended up on a shorter list, right? Who, who was the person who said, hey, I got a story about a person you might like, and, and, and how did that person know about Florida? Well, I, I, I think I might be that person um, <laughs> because um, after having uh, learned about her while researching the, uh, who, who the, the first black property owners in Brookline might be, uh, we had, uh, we being the Historical Society, had a, a booth at Brookline Day at Lars Anderson Park in uh, 2018. And uh, we put together uh, six or eight posters of Brookline people who uh, people might not have heard about or might have heard about, but didn't know that there was a Brookline connection. And she was one of them. And uh, we had that poster uh, hanging from uh, our, our booth and uh, the folks who were there looking for nominees for a new name for the school saw the poster, uh, 
asked if they could borrow it and bring it over to their table, and they did. And, um, and I, I believe that's how the name got into contention um, uh, for uh, a renaming of the school. Um, I, 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 it, it, might have, it might have come up otherwise, but um, uh, she was, you know, uh, Barbara Brown from Hidden Brookline. Hidden Brookline does a lot to look at the, um, the hidden history of slavery in Brookline and bring it to light. But there are other parts of, of, of Brookline's history, especially its uh, history of, uh, of African Americans in Brookline that are hidden even beyond slavery. And, um, uh, and, and she, she was kind of hidden. I don't know if she would have been discovered if I hadn't kind of stumbled upon her and, and, uh, and, 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 and put that poster together. So uh, I, I can't say for certain that that's how it happened, but uh, I like to think that it did. And, and uh, I'm very uh, pleased and proud that, uh, that uh, she's been the name that's been chosen for the school. You know, there's there's quite a bit of poetry there. You know, there's the maybe more more direct or more obvious poetry of changing the name of a school from a former slave owner to someone who fought to expand rights and privileges um, to lots of different people, women, people of color, um, even Hawaiians, as it were. Um, but there's also another bit of poetry, and that is that. Um, someone who cared enough about the history of people of color um, was rediscovered by someone who cares so much about the history of Brookline. And now by the community putting her name on the school um, helps all of us to rediscover some of that very history that Florida uh, was so intent on us remembering. And so that there's, there's a little poetry there. And this is, this is all new to me. These are not set up questions. I'm learning with you at home, right? I mean, this is what's so fun about the show. Uh, listen, Ken, thank you so much for your time. I know you, um, I know you love to, to do this historical work and I know you love to teach. Uh, for those who don't know, Ken gives historical walks in different neighborhoods throughout the town. Um, I, I don't know if you're still doing it sort of from a distance in COVID or if we've got to wait another few months. I've been on several of them. Uh, if, you're, if you're into architecture, it's fascinating. Uh, if you're into understanding how the architecture ties in with the rest of history, it's also interesting. The fact of the matter is it's easy to walk around and point at old buildings because they're still here. And so some of the tours really sort of center, at least um, rely on that architecture. Uh, but so Ken, you're, you're, you're a wonderful asset for Brookline. Uh, the Brookline Historical Society uh, is phenomenal and I know quietly goes about doing, uh, doing the great work that it does. I hope folks will uh, find your website and I hope that as, as we come out of COVID and as the weather gets better, people will take the opportunity to transition from reading the blog posts and reading online to um, getting outside of their home and, and sort of seeing in person and, and breathing in uh, that history. So, so Ken, thanks for everything you do. Uh, viewers, you've been watching Brookline Interactive Group, TV on TV, and uh, we hope that you will tune in tomorrow at 3.30 for the live um, ceremony to rename uh, the school, the Florida Rough and Ridley School, and you can do that by watching uh, just as you are now, either online or uh, on your television, Brookline Interactive Group. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.